Subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscription button below. For future webinars and online short courses, please visit our website at australianwaterschool.com.au. Welcome to the 61st Australian Water School webinar brought to you by Ice Warm. Today we're going to look at the very important issue of South Asian hydropower in the era of climate change presented by Dr. Aditya Pillai. Uh, it's great to have you with us. My name's Trevor Pillar. I'm the National Partnerships Manager here at Ice Warm and the webinar chair. This webinar series brings you the brilliant innovative thinking coming from the global water sector. It's so good to see everybody here today. You can see that map on your screen right now spread across the globe. This is going to be a very interesting time together, I'm sure. The next thing is the training. There's a ton of uh, training. There. I won't go through each one, but you can see how much is coming up in the next few months, and there's all that and more coming up throughout the whole year. We'd love to have you be part of our free webinars, online courses, and face-to-face -face courses. All that aside, we're so glad today to welcome Aditya Pillai to our uh, uh, webinar today. Thanks for joining us, uh, Aditya. You're uh, in New Delhi at the moment, yeah. is that right? Yeah. Hi, Trevor. Yeah. Uh -huh. in New Welcome and, and glad to have you with us. Aditya is a senior researcher for the Centre for Poli Policy Research Initiative on Climate, Energy and the Environment uh, in New Delhi, India. Uh, he studies how states arrange their climate change institutions. He looks at the politics of regional elect electricity trade in South Asia, but he also looks at trans river, transboundary river issues uh, for the Indus, the Ganga and the Brahmaputra, uh, climate change adaptation to inland waterway cooperation and energy. By and large, food, water and energy is his very complex bag to deal with. <laughs> so we're glad to have you today, uh, Aditya. Uh, this is going to be some interesting times together. Thank you so much, Aditya, for making this time available across the globe. And uh, we've got so many of people joining and uh, very keen to hear what you have to say. So, well, no more, um, no more chat. We'll just get straight into this. Um, thank you very much for joining us and I'll hand right over to you. Uh, to take us through the next 20 or 30 minutes. People, be, be ready with your questions and comments. In fact, start writing them now. That'd be abso absolutely fine. Uh, and we'll take them on board as they come up. Thanks, Aditya. Right. Um, and you can see the screen? All clear. Oh. Absolutely brilliant. Great. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining um, uh, from many, many, many different time zones, it looks like, and uh, taking the time from your day uh, for this. So today we're going to be talking about South Asian hydropower and the era of climate change. Um, and the philosophical underpinning um, of this presentation, the conversation we'll be having um, after this is uh, to trace the adaptation of what is a technology that came of age in the mid 20th century and now must confront uh, a recent transition to more pressing policy issues of the day, uh, particularly climate change. Uh, and this transition has been fairly rocky as we'll see um, we'll start by talking about a technology in decline. Uh, over the last 30 years, especially in South Asia, um, there have been questions um, and difficulties around how to integrate hydropower and large dams uh, into current energy systems. Uh, and this has been extremely pronounced in the last 10 years or so. Um, these don't necessarily have to do with the inherent properties of the technology itself. Uh, but more about how society is structured around this technology, how incentives are structured, and how risk and reward are distributed. We'll then move um, into a little bit of a discussion on whether hydropower could see its rebirth um, after these tough years um, in the rise of renew renewables. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit uh, about the churn of technologies uh, at present um, in particular, uh, the rise of uh, batteries and how adoption, uh, uh, the adoption of battery technology um, is increasingly prevalent in energy markets across the world. Um, and then we take a little bit of a look back uh, in, to India's previous uh, large policy transition, the early 90s, that came with liberalization, privatization of the energy sector. And that's something that didn't stick uh, to hydropower and large dams. Um, and then finally, we end uh, on a broader question of the role of the state uh, in addressing uh, climate change impacts. So let's start with the past. The original intent uh, in South Asia, uh, the original animating idea uh, behind large dams um, was to address food security problems um, and to end hunger. Um, this, and you can see this in this graph, it um, really takes off. So th this graph is essentially um, hydro, um, hydropower as a part of the energy mix 
um, and you see it had its um, uh, in India, uh, I should specify. Um, and um, you can see that in the 60s um, and 70s, that's, that's the heyday, and then it sort of declines. And then this is particularly marked um, in um, the 90s, um, and then it stays fairly low at about uh, 20%, um, um, and then falls um, even further um, after that. Um, and this 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 uh, decline in the 90s is actually um, a, a pertinent uh, little data point for our conversation today, um, and that's because of the rise of thermal energy. Um, India's need to put more uh, energy in the grids, more power in the grids to uh, address economic um, uh, growth pressures um, leads to a policy that incentivizes quick adoption uh, of thermal that can be built fast and generates fairly consistently and doesn't come um, with many of the land acquisition social issues that um, dams um, come with. So th this, this little graph is a nice, nice microcosm of some of the things we'll be talking about um, so, um, moving, moving on um, into the 1990s, um, from uh, the utility of uh, dams for agriculture, we see the beginnings of resistance. Um, and these are social movements that um, uh, popped up across the world, um, uh, famously in India, the Nalmada Bachao Andolan, um, um, uh, led by uh, personalities such as Medha Patkar. Um, and that led to the World Commission of Dams um, in the late 90s and early 2000s. That brings about um, a, 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 a massive uh, paradigm shift in public policy that undergirds um, um, large dams and hydropower and a, regulate, um, and a tightening of uh, regulations. So social and environmental protections then become central to the dam building project um, in uh, the 2000s. And um, many developers that we've spoken to uh, over the past couple of years have uh, pointed to this as a central um, issue. But the larger theoretical um, idea here is that democracies often have to put these things uh, in place to build legitimacy. Um, and and, and um, navigating that path is actually um, not the easiest thing to do. Moving quickly forward, um, we see the rise of um, solar and renewables. Um, this is in the 2010s. Um, falling global uh, prices and liberal trading regimes, and uh, mainly sourced from China, uh, Chinese production at scale of solar panels um, led to um, a, a pretty phenomenal drop um, in uh, module prices uh, for solar. Um, and uh, this is something that was not protected by tariffs. I, we're seeing a little bit of a change uh, in that now across the world, uh, particularly in the US and India, uh, where we're erecting uh, uh, tariff barriers uh, to solar imports from China. Um, but it has led, I think, without a doubt, uh, to the introduction of a new technology to the energy mix that is extremely, extremely competitive. Um, and old technologies such as hydropower and, and thermal power are faced um, with, with this competition, trying to figure out what role they will play in this new look um, energy mix. Um, so you see hydro, which was once thought of um, in, in, in the policy imagination as uh, a 60-40 source. Um, and by that, uh, I mean 60% uh, thermal and 40% uh, um, hydropower is currently around 13% uh, of uh, installed um, Indian capacity. Um, just to give you a, a broad sense of the uh, prices, I, I've converted the, the prices here to US dollars just to make it um, universally understood. Uh, but solar at the moment, um, um, the, the price of sale after uh, constructing a utility scale, scale storage plant, I mean, sorry, solar plant is uh, about 3.5 um, to 4.3 cents. Um, and I've taken this number from a recent parliamentary standing committee report um, uh, on energy. That's the Indian parliament, of course. Uh, they had a report uh, titled uh, very simply Hydropower. Um, and it came out in uh, January 2019. Uh, the parliamentary standing committee has been fairly active uh, on hydropower. They had one a couple of years ago. Uh, and these are useful sources of information. So um, if you're interested in digging a little bit deeper, um, you'll find that online. 
Um, so they, they say that this price um, um, uh, has to compete against uh, a price for hydro um, that is between US cents uh, uh, 8.5 to 9.4. And they, this is for a typical um, market financed um, hydropower plant. Um, and by typical, uh, they mean the hydropower plant is located or the dam, a dam is located in an area that's um, geologically uh, sound um, in that they've been able to figure out um, exactly how they're going to build it and where they're going to build it. Um, and um, also it's not in extremely remote um, uh, terrain. So a lot of um, hydropower in South Asia at the moment, particularly in India actually, um, is uh, faces the infrastructure challenges of building essentially a large complex bit of infrastructure in areas that have previously been untouched uh, by human activities. That means building the roads, building the transmission lines through extremely complicated uh, terrain um, in the mountains uh, more than anything else. Um, so this, this has had an effect over the last couple of years. Uh, we've seen these uh, changes in market dynamics um, and the economics of power generation uh, affect invest investment signals um, uh, across um, South Asia. Um, I, mean, I think we've seen it uh, definitely in how the state um, approaches um, um, approaches hydropower, particularly um, in in India. We've seen it a little bit. Um, in the private sector of uh, Nepal, which is uh, uh, which is uh, heavily vested in hydropower at the moment, uh, including the stock market, where there's a significant significant amount of investment in uh, hydropower. Um, though uh, I must qualify um, on Nepal, I, I don't really know if uh, that investment is slowed uh, after these uh, recent developments. Um, here we've uh, constructed, so this is uh, from a paper that I wrote with my co-author Sagar Prasai um, last year, where we tried to source um, um, price, price information um, on uh, various uh, forms of uh, power. Now, uh, some, of, some of these numbers are a little bit dated because there have been regulatory changes around this stuff um, in the last few months. Um, and a lot of it, we've tried to be conservative about these numbers because you know, as you can imagine, the, there are a lot of hydropower plants out there. There are a lot of coal plants out there, a lot of solar and getting a levelized cost, um, particularly uh, for new plants is, 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 is pretty difficult. But to just run you through this graph, um, you'll see that um, hydropower, um, 0 0.09 USD, which is about 9 cents, has to compete against coal, which is about 4.6, um, and solar, which is also maybe about uh, 4.6 or so. And, you know, there's uh, a, sl a slightly high number. Maybe it's about 2.9 rupees, but that does, doesn't change um, too much. And you can see that markets um, around India that produce hydropower um, have to have to deal with these uh, price signals coming from the Indian market. So uh, Nepal um, uh, producing about 7.3 um, and uh, um, Bhutan um, at about uh, uh, six cents. Um, so it is it is it is a competitive market, um, and all the all the technical nitty gritty and the policy nitty gritty that goes with. Uh, building a hydropower plant um, or a dam um, changes the economics of this, particularly when you have a new entrant that doesn't have fuel costs associated with it because the sun is free. Um, this 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 really changes um, it changes the game quite a bit. Now I'm I'm um, I must say that we got a, a little bit of pushback on these numbers, uh, mainly because a lot of this is changing. And one of the comments was, well, you haven't. Uh, really factored in the social costs and the environmental costs of coal. These are artificially reduced prices, uh, and that is that is really true. Uh, so, um, and and I do believe that uh, re policy changes over the next 10, 20 years will definitely start pricing coal higher uh, based on environmental costs. Um, but these are just reflections of the way policy is structured right now, right? And um, uh, we have here how we source this. So this is just a lot of um, 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 a lot of data on how we figured out these numbers. Um, moving moving further down, um, um, we 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 profile here, and this this I thought was a very very useful useful little table. 
um, they came again from the Parliamentary Standing Committee. So the way it works is the Parliamentary Standing Committee turns to Ministry of Power in India um, and asks them um, to answer certain questions. And one of the questions they ask them is, why is it that so many hydropower projects um, are currently um, stalled? Um, and you can see that this is, this is a, in terms of capacity that's um, currently um, stalled, this is actually a fairly large number, totaling about 6,000 megawatts, um, um, and a fair number of projects too, but the distribution is actually the most interesting bit. Um, so uh, financial constraints, and this is, this is something that we can get into a little bit deeper because there are complex financial issues that are buffeting um, um, uh, power markets across across South Asia, particularly in India, not least the non-performing asset problem um, that uh, the government's been trying to solve. Uh, but also um, judicial intervention has been uh, the mainstay um, of um, restraint uh, to hydropower and dams. And you can see that uh, a bulk of it is actually down to subjudice uh, matters. And uh, NGT is the National Green Tribunal, which is um, a, a quasi-judicial uh, body um, in in India that uh, legis uh, that uh, uh, judges um, uh, environmental cases. Um, then, of course, you have um, legacy uh, resettlement and rehabilitation issues, and these these actually um, are things that the state hasn't been very good at solving. I think we've had decades um, of uh, of these issues, and a lot of the mobilization around um, hydropower and dams. Um, comes from uh, these legacy questions about whether we've been um, adept enough or in, in, in solving these complex issues and creating livelihoods, housing, and so on that is uh, better than uh, what the resettled population originally had. Um, and it, the, it, to, to put it simply, it's a question of can an all-thumb state um, deal with with very complex social dynamics that come around the building of large infrastructure. Um, to just sort of summarize um, the narrative, the political narrative um, that, that accompanies um, um, hydropower in, in South Asia, um, uh, to, to, to put one line on it, um, the idea is that hydropower's prosperity for mountain geographies sold to uh, support uh, economic activity in Indian plains. Um, and that essentially is the overall logic uh, that, uh, that animates this uh, sector. Um, I want to point out here that on the demand side, we've been talking a lot about the supply stuff um, uh, in, in previous graphs and points, uh, but the demand side uh, uh, stuff about, that accompanies Indian distribution companies um, uh, incentives um, to um, buy hydropower is, is, is a complicated story. And um, I, I, I note here that it's caught between the scissor action of power sector liberalization um, and fiscal uh, reform. Now, uh, just to very quickly go over what that means, um, uh, India has an Electricity Act that was passed in 2003 that, the, um, that they proposed amend amendments to. And one of the sort of uh, big changes that came out of that, and this is in line with uh, policy changes across the world, um, starting from the UK in the 80s, was uh, to allow more consumer choice. So a distribution company or a large, um, uh, a large industry could choose who they bought their electricity from, which meant uh, that there was a competitive dynamic introduced amongst generators um, um, and um, other people purchasing, uh, selling power, um, including power traders. Um, and and that, that has caused uh, a, a big problem for distribution companies because they're sort of locked into um, these uh, legacy purchase orders, what they call power purchase agreements um, uh, in India. Um, and they are paying for those, and yet they have consumers migrating out of the system and choosing to buy directly from a generator that is offering a cheaper price than the distribution company can offer them. Um, and the second variable here is, of course, fiscal, uh, fiscal reform. And I, I, I want to mention that this is fiscal reform of the distribution companies, uh, particularly. Um, the, a, a scheme launched by the government of India called Uday, 
um, very recently um, has put pressure on distribution companies to sort out their bottom line. Um, distribution companies in the 70s and 80s um, were extremely focused on uh, uh, supplying power to uh, agricultural markets, um, uh, particularly large farmers, um, at extremely low prices. Um, and this was driven by uh, major shifts in politics. Um, uh, democratic governance creates incentives um, to um, target um, uh, voter groups that are important. Um, as India became more competitive democratically uh, through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, we saw a slew uh, of concessions uh, to the farm, um, particularly in the form of uh, free or cheap energy, and started, I think it was with Tamil Nadu, um, if I'm not mistaken, 1977. Um, and then by about 1997, you saw uh, meters, a uh, demetering of the Punjab agriculture market. So um, across South Asia, Punjab is really the core, um, the core uh, production hub uh, for grains and and other products. Um, and that's led to these dis distribution companies uh, looking around for new sources of um, revenue, but most of the time not being able to find them. Um, and that essentially meant that they're always in the red. Just a uh, quick interruption, if I may, um, Aditya. We're about halfway through time-wise, but there's a couple of interesting questions just on, come up on the um, on the chat line. One from Stephanie Jensen, if I may, just um, uh, interpose this question. Um, Stephanie says um, it's widely knowledge that the Himalaya region and rivers uh, are particularly vulnerable to climate change, glacier melting, snow avalanches. Is there any evidence that hydro companies, governments, financiers are integrating climate change risks into their designs? Yeah, that's, that is a great question. Um, and as far as I know, we poke, poked around with this, um, yep. it, it poked around into this a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, this, I think it was uh, 2017 when we spoke to a, 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 a fair number of hydropower developers, particularly in Himachal Pradesh. Um, and um, which is a mountainous state in the Himalayas, of course. Um, and there is very little uh, integration of climate change modeling um, wow. into uh, planning. So we're essentially seeing these dams built on um, legacy data um, and not um, a lot of focus on the uncertainty variability around precipitation and glacial melt. Uh, not only for generation, but also in terms of disaster management and uh, dam viability in the face of disasters. So yeah. that is not something that's caught on in South Asia. Um, as far as uh, I know, I don't think it's changed very much in the uh, 24 months since we had those uh, conversations. That's great. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And thanks, Stephanie, for your question. Well, maybe we'll just leave it there. We'll, we'll press on with the, um, with the presentation. Thanks a lot, Aditya. Um, but there is uh, quite a bit to get through and we've had about 15 minutes to go. Yep. All right. Thank yeah, you. Yep. I'll, I'll, thank you. I'll speak. Right. Um, now, so uh, there was an interesting little moment uh, last year. We had a conversation with hydropower developers across India. Um, and um, there was a lot of groaning about the fact that renewables are just so cheap. How do we compete against them? There's no way this technology can compete. And, you know, if we have X amount of capital, why on earth would we invest it in hydropower? Let's just put it in solar. The government wants us to put it there. Isn't that the right thing to do? And one of the participants um, who is a central figure in, 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 in um, uh, uh, policymaking at the moment said, you guys have this all wrong. Solar power is actually your best friend. It's not your worst enemy. Um, and um, this really gets to the heart of the question of can we transition um, hydropower from just regular baseload power to peaking power? Um, because India is adding solar power at breakneck rates, right? Um, and it has slowed a little bit in the last 24 months for, um, because of tariffs and protectionist instincts that are now coming to the fore. Uh, but I think this graph from uh, the Energy Resources Institute that does a lot of good work on this stuff, um, uh, really shows you uh, the extent of that decline. So we're looking at a graph here that stretches six years. Um, and just if you focus on the blue line, which is lowest tariff discovered, um, um, and you know the median tariff, I'd argue, is not a lot higher than this, um, uh, especially in recent years. But you know it's moved from 10.95 Indian rupees to 4.34 in 2016, which was a big eye-opener moment for uh, the entire uh, energy sector. 
Um, and also, um, you can see that capacity addition, which with these orange lines here, have been going up quite fast. Um, and uh, this graph from the World Resources Institute really shows you the ambition of it. Uh, India plans to add uh, 100 uh, gigawatts of solar by uh, 2022. Um, um, and I mean, it's an open question whether we'll get there. Some say yes, some say no. But uh, just just the ambition of the policy statement is a signal to markets in and of itself. Um, and um, so, th and this is a graph of a graph of new wind projects. You can see that it's highly distributed. And a lot of the questions around whether markets in um, Nepal and Bhutan can effectively supply um, and and balance India's peaking troubles. Um, and stave off uh, the prospect of solar and wind curtailment really comes down to uh, the, the geographic uh, expanse of uh, India in the sense that can you have mountains here go all the way to highly RE penetrated markets in say Karnataka or Tamil Nadu. So Karnataka I think at the moment is about 50, on the solar front is about 53% of its in installed capacity um, is um, solar. So it's actually a majority um, solar uh, mix. Um, of course, generation is is, is much lower. Um, and so, wind goals again, stated intent um, is to put up about uh, 60. So this is India's um, INDC, uh, NDC, national determined nationally determined contribution to the Paris Accord, uh, with one of which is to put up put up 175 gigawatts of renewables. Um, and, and that's where a lot of these projections are coming from. And there's, there's been a fair amount of excitement around this. You can see that India actually surpassed its target for wind uh, in uh, uh, 2017. Um, but I also want to point out that moving to uh, peak times has contractual operational implications that we may not get into too much here. Um, but one of the things I want to point out is that if the, the hydropower plant is in the state which has high RE concentration, it's much easier to, and, and, and is owned by the state, it's much easier to rejig the operations to make sure that it's uh, putting out peak power. But if it's a private sector plant that's locked into a long-term contract, or if the jurisdictions are split, where a state wants peaking power, but the plant it's deriving it from is belongs to another political entity, um, such as uh, the central government of India, it's much more difficult to manage those coordination problems, right? Now, uh, Karnataka is a great example. There is evidence of a shift. Um, um, it's a state with high RE concentrations, like I mentioned. This is a great graph from my colleague Santosh Harish at the Center for Policy Research in Rahul Tongya, who does great work in Brookings, India. Um, and um, the essence of this graph, I won't really get into it, but is that you can actually see um, hydro being used, deployed quite aggressively uh, at peaking moments. Um, so it's, it's really being used um, to manage um, uh, power demand when the sun goes down, people come home and turn on their lights. Um, so uh, these are the questions, of course, that I asked. Um, what happens when jurisdictions are split? And can South Asian electricity trade play an important part in this renewable story, particularly um, if dams are built purposefully targeting um, India's um, uh, uh, power demand in the evenings. Um, and here's a nice little graph from the Central Electricity Authority that they presented a couple of years ago that actually talks about their ambition for 2035. You see the number of interconnections with India and also a fair number of interconnections, transmission interconnections, of course, between um, uh, points of generation in Nepal. Um, one of the questions that we, of course, ask is, um, hydropower and dams, are they going to be lost in the churn of technologies? Uh, here we have a graph from uh, EIA um, that looks at battery adopt uh, large grid scale battery storage um, in US pa uh, power markets. So these are the seven ISOs, uh, independent system operators in um, US power markets. And you can see really took off 2015, uh, uh, 2014 onwards. Uh, and that trend has grown. and um, this graph here shows that the prices are actually quite reasonable. So this is long-term um, uh, energy capacity at dollars per kilowatt hour, it's about 500. Um, and uh, for short-term power, power capacity installment costs, um, 
uh, in dollars per kilowatt, uh, you can see it's about a thousand. So this, I think, will take a little more time to dig into and explain. And it's an interesting graph. I'm sure um, uh, some of you have comments on this. Um, and uh, here from Irina, we have uh, a nice little graph that projects uh, decline uh, in battery prices. And you can see out to 2030, they project uh, a fairly sharp decline, uh, almost to a third of its current uh, prices for large-scale battery storage. And I, I like this graph because they actually predict why um, this, this will fall by that much. Um, so uh, I just want to point out Two, two little things uh, that um, a lot of the incentive for peak shaving um, is um, currently beyond the pale of uh, regulation or technology. Installing smart meters, time of day pricing is not some, I mean, people talk about it, but it's not something that's happening at the moment. And also, please keep in mind, it's very important what newly electrified populations, around 300 million in India, quite a few in Bangladesh, quite a few in Nepal, do first with their electricity. Are they going to buy fridges? Or are they going to buy ACs? These are big questions that will determine what the peak is and how much hydropower or batteries will have to balance the grid uh, and therefore how much battery or hydro you need to do that. India has always had transition troubles, moving technologies from one mode to another. Um, and you can see this. I just want to point this out. Um, there was there was the heady days um, of India's privatization, liberalization led to the privatization of the energy sector. Um, there was a call for pr proposals from the private sector, which led to 243 proposals coming in. Um, memora memoranda of understanding was signed. Only 13 were actually uh, 13 actually ever materialized, and it were commissioned, uh, of which uh, a large number um, are still under construction or stalled. Um, so the steering role of the state never really materialized, and risk has always been greater than reward. Uh, and we're now looking at a new transition where risk, of course, is amplified, so is reward. Um, it's an open question whether the state can steer, um, steer the sector, hydropower sector, through, through, the, through this complicated terrain. Um, I just want to move now, finally. Uh, Trevor, um, we're, we're done with time, aren't we? Uh, we're going okay. Another couple of minutes would be really, really fine. There's a few questions coming up on the board, but let's just uh, round off in the next two or three minutes. Would that be all right? Okay, perfect, perfect. Yep. Um, yeah, I, that, that's great because um, I just want to ask this broader question. I mean, we live in the age of the Green New Deal and so much excitement uh, about finally seeing a policy shift um, and, and a governance framework, really, um, a, a governance ideology that puts the state at the center of transitioning to uh, a more climate-proof uh, economy. Um, and a lot, of the, um, um, a lot of the impulse here is, to say, is, is, is driven by the state putting its money um, and uh, uh, money behind uh, new technologies, um, uh, like we were talking about earlier, steering old technologies in ways that make sense, creating jobs, um, and essentially creating this new idea of a green economy, which is fairly complicated. Uh, but then the question is, what does the state do? Uh, put on your policymaker hat, and uh, a lot of you are, are policymakers, so you don't have to put on any hats. But I'm sure these are questions that all of us confront in some way, shape, or form or the other. Um, and um, these, are the, these are the questions uh, to us. Do we invest aggressively in renewable technologies and, and, and sort of balance it later on? Do we use legacy investments, protect their political economy, and use this as a part of the green transition? So a lot of the conversation in India has been, maybe we can deploy the existing thermal fleet to balance the grid in the evening. Um, and and um, there's been a fair amount of conversation on this. Some say it's feasible. Uh, a lot say that we can hit our first target of 175 gigawatts of renewable energy just with thermal balancing. We don't really need to invest in expensive um, 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 gas plants or uh, new dams and hydropower. Um, or does the state put its money and uh, energy behind um, research and development for frontier technologies? Um, and uh, battery is great, great case in point. Um, and for all of these things, um, it's going to be uh, a hit and miss situation um, because this, uh, there'll have to be enough policy com commitment, political will to lose out 
uh, on a bunch of technologies, select new ones, um, and create policies around them that may fail and may work, and then in an iterative process, make sure we get to a point where we have uh, a policy architecture that makes sense in moving to a zero carbon economy, uh, or at least a low carbon economy for developing countries, um, uh, particularly South Asia. Um, and hydropower really sits at the intersection of all of these questions. You know, old technology could be repurposed. How do we, uh, com if the state is the only person that can actually manage the risk of building new plants, does it put its money there or does it invest in uh, research and development um, that that is useful to the uh, South Asian context. Um, so uh, these these are questions that I thought would be interesting, uh, particularly in, uh, as we're going into a Q and A session. Trevor, hugely thought provoking. Thanks very much, Aditya. You've done so much work here yourself and your colleagues here at the Centre for Pol Policy Research. Where um, where. I don't know where to start really, but there is one good question here to start on. But I, I just wanted to pick up on your point about the state um, being at the centre of climate change uh, adaptation. Um, it seems to load all of the um, all of the uh, responsibility in one area, and you're raising that raising the very point that uh, that's probably not going to be a, a complete solution. Um, and, and that's a really, really, I think that's a crucial point there. Um, Santosh Adhikari asked this, this, this incredible question. My, my concern is over storage projects. How vulnerable are they in regard to climate change? It's on the chat line if you want to open the chat line uh, to yeah. read this. It's, it didn't come from the Q&A, everybody. If you can write your questions in the Q&A, like, everybody is. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Santosh, it's a good question here. Uh, he, he says, um, how vulnerable are storages in regard to climate change? During my master's thesis in Norway, I i modelled the climate change effect in terms of sedimentation and reservoir yeah. sustainability. The results, yeah. sedimentation increased, causing deterioration of live storage. So what other impacts could be anticipated beforehand uh, pl planning a storage project in South Asia? So I think the sediment question is, is really spot on, right? I think you, you, uh, Santosh is absolutely right. The climate change stuff, just, just the flow, um, glacial mantle, all of those things are major questions. There's, there's a social side to it, which is just deforestation and aggressive building on the hillsides. Um, that's going to increase sedimentation too. And a lot of Himalayan rivers, I think this goes without saying. I mean, if you, if you look at the Kosi Balaj built in, um, what was it, the 60s? Um, uh, there's a ton of sediment around it. And, 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 and governments are trying very hard to do the work of removing those sediments. Uh, but the entire North Indian plain, let's remember, is sediment, right? All the way from yeah. Delhi out to yeah. Calcutta, so yeah. it's sediment. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> you make that good point. <laughs> no way of getting out of that. Yeah, it's a natural process. Yeah. Shall we move on then? Uh, Rob Richardson says, does the hydropower debate score additional value due to the associated improvement of water management or are the comparisons purely energy-based? That's a nice separation of the two issues right there. It's on um, the uh, can... a Q and A questions here. I can't see the question, but is the question the second, second one down on the Q and A? Uh, the third one down on the Q and A list from Rob Richardson. You'll see does does the hydropower debate score additional value due to the associated ah. improvement of water management? Right, 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 right. Yeah, this is this is this this is also supremely important. The the main narrative um, uh, amongst policymakers at the moment is that there are multiple crises that come with climate change. And if you're saying there's going to be a fair amount of uh, uh, distress caused by water scarcity, then just we need, you need to build a dam. If you if if you know there's there's uh, increased likelihood of flooding and extreme events, you need to build a dam, right? Um, and the, the question is really how much of that is filtering into policy thinking because it's policy making is not, um, is, it is, doesn't have a lot of foresight. It's mainly reactive, right? And I would be very curious. It's, it's really an open question. I, I don't know the answer to this, but I would be really curious to see how much of the flood and irrigation conversation back into into the dam building project, maybe going back to what it was in the 60s, right? Where it was yeah. the food security thing, where the water was the main variable in building a dam rather than um, just um, um, electricity. So it, it'll, it'll require a paradigm shift in the thinking behind this stuff 
which may be happening, but there's no real evidence to say it's happening yet. Yeah. Uh, a couple of questions, Rob's again also around the issue of is India moving into pumped hydro storage? Mm, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, questions there. Mm. yeah, the pumped hydro stuff. Um, so it has about 2,200 megawatts of pumped hydro already. Um, there's been a fair bit of fair bit of activity recently on the pump hydro stuff, particularly from the Central Electricity Authority. Um, I on, I can't remember the number, but I think they'd said 10,000 megawatts. I mean, I, I, this would have to be checked, but they said 10,000 megawatts in the next few years of pump storage. Definitely activity around this stuff, yeah. Yeah, because uh, pumped hydro is going to be like... A multiple hours of um, continuous electricity compared to only minutes with a, um, a large-scale utility-scale battery, uh, lithium-ion batteries. But, but that's another question for another day, maybe. But, but just the complexity of building it is also uh, yeah. another question, right? I'm not... It, it's, it's maybe twice as complicated as building just a regular dam, just yeah. trying to figure that stuff, stuff out. Yeah. But if you integrate it with solar, and if you do the pumping action through solar, that that actually would be a uh, a nice benefit. But yeah, I'm not commenting either way, but just dis describing the variable. That's certainly the, the direction that Australian thinking is going in, using uh, wind and solar to, right. to do the pumping part of it. Yeah. Another one here is, if we substitute large dams with micro hydro systems, will that reduce the climate change effect? <laughs> these are, I mean, th these are these are highly complex questions. Sure. Um, I am not sure. Um, one of my colleagues um, was uh, had gotten into a pilot project uh, with Pico Hydro, in fact, uh, and setting up distributed uh, power distribution, um, sort of decentralized power distribution grids um, in really small villages. Seemed to work. People were very happy with it. Um, also has you know some minimal amount of storage. Um, and, and, you know, there's this big stream of thinking in the literature on how uh, power sectors in the 20th century were highly centralized. Um, and now it's moving to a more decentralized uh, framework. Um, and hydro, I think, um, um, is, 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 is also subject to those forces, just like solar is and so on. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's feasible. I, I haven't really thought about the policy and politics of it. So, yeah. Yep, that, well, there's a ton of questions we could start picking on here. And then where to go to here? Uh, oh, the fairly easy one by Santosh up here. I think your, he says, I presume this is kilowatt hours, the um, the quotes for three and four cents earlier in the um, in the talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The sorry. Yeah. yeah, that's that's okay. That's all good. Um, uh, right, other guidelines, Ramesh is saying, um, other guidelines issued by the government of India in December 18, likely to promote exports from Nepal to India or more likely from Nepal to Bangladesh? Who, who's this question from? This is uh, Ramesh, the top top question in the, uh, in the Q&A. Uh, right. like I, 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 I thought you might ask that question. Um, so um, um, uh, Ramesh Vaidya and his colleagues at SMART have done some fantastic work yep. around power um, um, um across borders in South Asia. Sure. Um, the new guidelines, um, uh, I recently wrote about it in January. Um, it is definitely a move to loosening up the market because India came out in 2016 with these guidelines that were highly restrictive yeah. um, and essentially put India as the intermediary in any any sort of arrangement. A couple of couple of couple of interesting points, right? So, so they ex they dropped the explicit mention of um, ownership rules, right? Mm -hmm. So earlier they had said. Um, it has to be either an Indian government-owned plant or majority owned by um, um, a, an Indian company that trades uh, into Indian territory. Um, and that basically stifled foreign investment in Nepalese uh, and, Bhut well, Bhutan doesn't really think about foreign investment in hydropower, but also the private sector um, in Nepal that built hydro was, was suddenly stunned by this, right? And they said, oh, well, if, if you're not an Indian government or government of Nepal entity, then... You have to you have to get case by case approval. So this is really like wedging wedging government approval into the process of electricity trade across borders. They've dropped that in the new guidelines. The second bit is they've allowed the trilateralization of um, of power. So now Bangladesh, which is really looking for power to substitute its depleting gas, has turned to Nepal and Bhutan and said, "Can we get some of your hydropower?" Only problem being, there's India is a geographic intermediary there uh, and India is now in principle allowed trilateralization. 
Um, just going back to uh, the uh, uh, paper that um, uh, Ramesh Vaidya um, and, and others wrote uh, a few years ago, they, they did a great job profiling different types of um, power markets, um, uh, regional power pools, um, and they found that China, uh, and we sort of extrapolate from that to dr draw this, uh, this, this uh, um, uh, typical evolution of a regional power pool, and we find that moving from just bilateral arrangements to uh, trilateral arrangements and then more complex governance architectures, such as an independent system operator uh, that spans countries, such as in North Pool, um, is, 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 is usually how it happens. Um, and we're moving from the bilateral to the trilateral stage in South Asia. So I'm sort of bullish, but I want to point out that the guidelines are also um, a little bit tricky in the sense that they do give the Indian government a lot of power to say no. Mm. Um, and, and I think we should be aware of that because leaving that ambiguity there doesn't do a whole lot for investor sentiment. It's not this come all trade all sort of liberal uh, thing that most people say it is. Um, so it's, it's a mixed bag, but it's better than it was two years ago. So yep. no, thank you. Uh, Batula Al Amina asks, uh, one of the constraints in the developing countries to build a dam for hydropower is a large budget. I wonder how many mini or pico hydro power plants in terms of providing energy supply and flood control. How about mini or pico hydropower plants? I don't yeah. know what a pico hydropower plant is. That second question down in the Q&A uh, list there uh, from Baitula. Right. I think, I think uh, pico is less than one megawatt. Right. Uh, right. Or, or maybe even smaller. I think micro is less than one megawatt and pico right. is even than that. Well, he's um, asking whether this uh, is, in terms of energy supply and flood control, a, an alternative here. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, honestly, if the conversation is around balancing the entire South Asian grid mm. in the evening, uh, there are serious problems with decentralized uh, balancing uh, um, um, uh, options. Um, if the conversation is about local electricity, Right. Um, and if it's about local water solutions, it makes makes a whole lot more sense. You know, a village of a thousand people is a small hydropower plant that um, it, it, it could work. But I think these big questions of how do you manage 175, 225 gigawatts of solar, um, that that stuff is a little more complicated because you need centralized grid management. Mm -hmm. You need really precise release of water. So it's that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you've got you've got grid stabilization, you've got river stabilization, yeah. flood yeah. irrigation, agricultural water. There's a lot of elements at play here. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, Fong Liff has has asked uh, this is the second question down: Is hydropower development projects still a strategic energy development in South Asia and in other countries, uh, or or have they chosen other optional sources? I think you might have covered this: you know, solar, wind, and, and others. See that question there. Right. That all, all the all the policy excitement is definitely around the new yep. renewables. There's no question about it. And I think there's a lot of soul searching right now about hydropower. Yep. Um, the new hydropower policy that's in the works has been in the works since 2014. Every few months, uh, there's a press release, a press report that says, "Oh, it's just about coming out." Um, but it has it is stuck at the level of the Indian cabinet, um, hmm. and it's it's interesting because I mean. All you know, I think it's more or less hearsay and press reports. But um, this this mainly comes down to the fact that they can't figure out the incentive structures for hydro. If you're going to include hydro in as a purchase obligation, like they did yeah. with renewables, it's really mm -hmm. driving the cost for yeah. distribution companies. Mm -hmm. you want to make them more fiscally healthy. Uh, so there are all these contradictions that have to be navigated, yeah. and we still don't have it now. Five years out after they started doing this and they have it all drafted and ready, financial incentives for hydropower. Yeah. Um, it's still not here. So it really gives you a sense of where the excitement is. There's a ton of, there's lots of things we could be talking. Is it, the questions are just endless and we were not going to get through them all. But thank you everybody for, for, you, for your participation, your questions. But we'll, we've got a few minutes left, 10 minutes left yet here. So let's, let's press away with these. This is really interesting. Thanks so much, Aditya. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anurag Mishra has asked, dear Aditya, very interesting presentation. You compared the cost of solar and hydro, quoting a parliamentary committee report. Normally, the cost of hydropower does not include profit made through other surface, services such as irrigation. Uh, 
do you feel there is a scope of integrating this with the tariff to make it potentially uh, to make hydropower cheaper? Yeah, um, yeah. This is a conversation pricing water, right? Uh, pricing water. Um, yeah, that's is. yeah, that, and 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 um, that that's a politically loaded question. Um, there's there's no question about it. Now, what is the system we're talking about? Is it that we have a dam and then we charge irrigation fees down to the farmer while we're not charging them electricity uh, <laughs> uh, at the moment? Uh, is that electorally feasible? I, mm. I, I really don't think so. The, then the next question is, can we find a model of funding uh, a model of revenue that doesn't involve the farmer directly for the irrigation um, and that again involves the state putting money in really. Um, I don't think it's on the horizon anytime. No. Theoretically, it's, 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 it's fine. I think for richer agricultural markets, it's, you know, it, it works. Um, but I don't, at the moment, I mean the, okay, so let's just take the last one year in agricultural, not policy, but subsidy, um, the government's moved fairly aggressively to providing greater subsidy um, to to farmers, loan waivers, and so on and so forth. Highly politically charged. Um, I'm I'm not sure that this current moment is the right moment to do it, or whether it's even feasible. But also, um, I think as agrarian stress increases, and this is just total projection, just stream of yeah. uh, consciousness thinking. Um, as agrarian distress increases, uh, I think it'll be harder to tack costs on to farmers. Um, yeah, yeah I, 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 for some reason, I don't think pricing water is really going to work. Hmm. No, that's fair. A couple more questions. Let's just take two more and then we'll, we'll call it a day, I think. Uh, Nora Yuki Mori has asked, what is your perspective about combining hydropower and floating solar PV on, on the reservoir, on the dam? Yeah, that's 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 happening. I think there are two two plants. Um, I think there are two hundred, three hundred megawatts each. Might be slightly higher, mm -hmm. uh, where they're trying to do that. And it it looks promising. Um, yeah. It it looks promising. Um, yeah. There's some there's some movement there. Very small here in Australia. Also, a couple of projects here that are going that yeah. way. Yeah. Let's make this our last question, shall we? Thanks, everybody. It's been fantastic. But um, Devesh has asked, uh, he said that 1.3% of all anthropogenic greenhouse emissions are attributed to methane emitted from reservoirs of a large dam across 100 years of their life. This exceeds rice planting. In this regards, are la large dams really clean? Yeah, I, uh, Devesh is talking about that study that came out, I think it was two years ago, that sort of synthesized data and sort of combined it and came up with this 1.3 degree, 1.3% uh, number. Where does, rate. Where does that 1 to 3% 3, 3 come from? Well, like, is, it, it, is it CO2 methane coming out of the base of the dam? Up? Yeah, it's submergence. So, I mean, if you build it in a highly forested area with warm temperatures, so it's tropical, um, right. you're going to see the composition of the carbon matter in the plants that leads to methane emissions. And the thing right. is, this is more or less consistent methane emissions, right? Because it goes as it yep. further decays. It, it increases and then I think the the average uh, potency of methane is 33 or 36 times carbon dioxide um, so it is a major concern I, I was very alarmed when I when I read that study I, I think I brought it up at ACMOD uh, in 2017 there was a lot of pushback on that comment because uh, hydropower developers generally don't want to think about this stuff um, the I can only tell you the narratives right so when I put this paper up um, um, the, the scientific People in the room said, yeah, you know, this is actually a major thing. We need to be thinking about it. Um, the, the policymakers in the room said, well, you know, this isn't completely true. And one of the things they said was, well, if it's in an area that doesn't have a lot of forest cover, um, it's not going to be that bad. And I don't think Indian hydropower mm -hmm. plants are known to be producing a lot of methane. Um, honestly, I think my personal sense is that methane will start being budgeted more carefully. Um, and once methane starts get, getting budgeted more carefully and the budgets become a central part of the planning process, you'll see more pushback on this. At the moment, this is seen as a fringe idea that, you know, um, by, by, the, by the powers that be, it's seen more as a fringe idea in South Asia. But I think over time, I think that realization will start seeping in a little bit more.
Yeah. I mean, carbon dioxide is a central question in um, uh, global warming. Took a while for it to permeate yeah. through the policy process, yeah. right? Now. Yeah. Other yeah. Questions, you know. That Oh, that's really great, Dan. Thank you, Ron, for your terrific questions. And uh, it's been such a thought-provoking and um, big, big issues being um, dealt with: irrigation, flood control, electricity. Uh, you know, it's a um, huge uh, confluence of ideas and um, a need for some deep thinking. Thanks so much for all your efforts on this, uh, Aditya, and uh, for everyone joining in today. You can see the free webinars coming up next. Ones uh, to do with the Alliance for Water Stewardship. It's, it's an interesting, um, a very um, uh, energetic group um, around water management. And there's a, few, a whole lot more powering to, to zero cost uh, energy future. Um, I won't go through them all, but do join us. There's a YouTube channel at the bottom there and a Twitter feed that you can uh, look us up on and also on the website. Uh, but I do want to give a shout out to the team here, Dr. Ian Reid, Michelle Ha, Joel Vortman, Claudia Faro, for all the work they do behind the scenes here. And it just works so smoothly because of them. Um, uh, thank you all for joining us. But um, I think that's all I need to say, but except for one thing, thanks so much, Aditya, for taking the time there okay. in New Delhi. Uh, with the Centre for Policy Research. I really appreciate the time you've taken today and so does everyone. There'll be a recording and uh, we, we'll be um, uh, living on for all time in, in the recording up on the website. Beautiful. Again, in, in the Ethernet. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's been right. great having you. Yep. Okay. Thanks very much and we'll see you All once right. again. Okay. See you, Trevor. See you Bye. again. Bye. Subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscription button for future webinars and online short courses, please visit our website at australianwaterschool.com.au.